Welcome to Cut Through the Noise with Dave Toronto, bringing you the truth behind the headlines in business and current events. Let's go. Today's topic is drinking. I have not done this as a topic yet, but I have had drinks in my life, so this will be interesting for me. I'm with life coach Caroline Holke, calling in from St. Louis, but is a Boston College grad, so we've got that we've got that connection to Massachusetts here. So Ka- Caroline is a, a life coach that works with women and helps them get rid of the shitty parts of drinking. So I'm sure she helps men too, but uh, for the purposes of this episode, we're gonna we're gonna stick we're gonna start there and then see where it goes. So Caroline, thanks for being with me today. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and you know with your listeners. It's a it, as you as you mentioned, it's a topic that most people have some interest in, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think all of us can relate to it. It's such a it's drinking, uh, casual drinking or excessive drinking is is has almost become a a norm. Everywhere you go, it, it, it's kind of part of what uh, social life is for people. I, I, and yeah. I don't mean to apply all people, but but we can we can dive into that. But let me let me ask you this: So you have a, you had a career as a as a marketing executive or, or something to mm-hmm. that effect before starting your company? Yeah, I was working in um, corporate marketing. I was in global marketing for a Fortune 100 company. And I did that for about 22 years. I was in the global part. I was in marketing for the whole time, but in the global part for like the last, I guess, almost 10 years. And I loved that. I think one of the things that really drew me to marketing was understanding kind of the human behavior side, understanding the what the consumers are looking for from a, from a needs standpoint, which is interesting now, I've kind of morphed a lot of that into coaching. That's what appeals to me about coaching. It's like understanding the individual's motivations, understanding what's going on for them, um, to help them make changes in their lives and, and help them achieve their goals. And so I come from a sales background and I, I relate on that level with what you just said. We can jump into that too. If I'm not careful, I'm going to get us into so many topics that we're going to talk for three weeks. But there's two things maybe we could talk about. One is 22 years in a job that may or may not have required you to say travel, you know, marketing uh, or sales, there's, there's a lot of on the road. Yep. And yep. sometimes when you get on the road, there's a lot of partying and drinking and staying yep. up late. Whether you want to or not, you got to go to this dinner and that dinner. Definitely. So there's that piece that I, I maybe we could explore, but also, you know, just the marketing piece of it. I mean, when you think about marketing and you think about sales and at the root of what marketing and sales is, it's appealing to the emotions of people. And if you're... If you're not careful, it can be very manipulative. And, and, and I'm wondering if, if at any level, and we can talk about this maybe second, is do you ever think about how we are marketing, say, alcohol or oh. pills or food or yeah. people and, oh. and that, the manipulation associated with that? So you, yeah. you can take it from here. I'll just, I'll just let you. Oh, my gosh. I don't even know where to start. Okay. So <laughs> let's say um, – you said something a minute ago and about how it's almost as if alcohol is normalized in our society. Alcohol is a hundred percent, a thousand percent normalized in our society. You know, you have to justify why you're not drinking. Now, let me just be provocative for a second and let me just picture for a moment, you're at a dinner table and you're sitting there with seven other friends. We've got eight people around the table and somebody passes around um, some cocaine. Right. And says, oh, you don't want any? Why don't you want any? Right, right, right. Well, you, it, it's polite to accept it. I'm sure at that point you should say yes, correct? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> you don't go through the mental right. gymnastics of, oh, well, you know, I don't want to. Yeah, you don't want to. You don't do that. You don't do that. Well, we do that absolutely with alcohol. Like, oh, I shouldn't. I, I, it would be rude if I said no. Now, also think about how, how normalized it is how you can have a glass of wine when you're getting your hair cut, when you're going to yoga, when you're going to the movie theaters, when you're going to the zoo with your kids, when you're, I mean, it is literally everywhere. And, and, it, and, it, and the reason for that, it's twofold. It is people want it, 
And the retail, whoever selling you whatever they're selling you, knows that that's a hook. You know, it's it's kind of a two-way street for sure. But at the at the end of the day, it is in every single facet of our lives, and that's what I think. Um, makes, makes it even more difficult, difficult for those of us who are gray area, area drinkers and we find ourselves in a situation where it's it's not dire. We know that it's not AA or rehab and, and I think everybody's very familiar with those abstinence only models, but when there's very low awareness of this space of people that are providing help for those who are gray area drinkers. Yeah. And what that looks like is very different for everybody. There's an inner understanding of I know something's not quite right with my drinking, or I know it could be better. How about that? You did mention that you're, you don't work with alcoholics per se. That's that's more for AA to deal with. But you're dealing with the everyday person who may be inadvertently overindulging or drinking too frequently. Going back to the work piece of it, I think a lot of people uh, just get caught up in the routine of whatever it is. Whether yes. you're traveling for a big corporate company or you're coming off a shift and you just want to hit, a, hit, hit the bar for a quick drink, or you're getting takeout and while you're waiting you have, you have a drink. I see so many people do this. It's, become, it's like getting a coffee in the morning. Yeah. You know, uh, Dunkin' Donuts is a, you, you know from being up here, Dunkin' Definitely. Donuts, it's, it's where everybody seems to get their coffee. It's become a habit for people. And it's not the coffee, it's this is what I do in the morning. I go through the drive-thru, I get my totally. Dunkin' Donuts coffee, and I keep going. And there's not a lot of thinking associated with that. Yeah, Same absolutely. Same thing with having a drink at lunch or maybe a drink after work. It's just mm-hmm. become so routine mm-hmm. that a lot of people don't know that, oh my goodness, I, gotta, I have a problem here. This has become a habit that I didn't realize was a habit. Right, and, and what, what, what happens so often is they get into, you know, the brain is supposed to find, like the brain is, our brain, our primitive brain is designed to habituate things, automate things, because it saves energy. There are all sorts of studies, and there have been movies and stuff about, like, if you could use more of your brain, like, if you could really access that. I mean, we use all of our brain. It's just most of it is subconscious. Most of it is automated. We don't think about brushing our teeth. We don't think about... A lot of times we can drive to work, and we're like, oh, here I am. You know, you don't, you don't really think about it consciously. And that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong. But there's so much shame and blame, and there's, like, this moral aspect to drinking normally... That a lot of times when people are stuck in that habit loop, they're like, they, they stay hidden. They don't raise their hand and say, I need some help. Because A, again, like there's low awareness that there is help for people in this space. And B, it's like, they don't want to. They don't want to ad- ad- address the shame that comes up with that. Because typically the people that I work with, I work with type A, high performing women who are like, they're badasses. They're doing really well in their career. They're doing really well in all these areas of their life. And they've figured out how to do all these hard things. And they look at this one and they're like, what is going on? Like, I, I, I will be able to figure this out. I, I know I can, but something is happening here that, that I can't, that I'm stuck. And the, the problem a lot of times is those same behaviors that help them get ahead in their career, that, like... I'm going to motivate, I'm going to like, I'm going to use my negative self-talk in some ways to kind of help me motivate. That does not help over here with drinking because once, once that inner mean girl starts kicking in, then hello, we want to escape with the drink. You had some of these experiences yourself as well before you started this company. Yeah. yeah. When did you realize that something's going on here and, and how long did it take you to, to do something about it? Yeah, I, um, that's a great question. I, I mean, I was always a drinker. I started drinking and when I was a teenager, it was very normal um, when I grew up. And so I'd always kind of consider myself a drinker. That was kind of part of my identi- my identity. I realized in my 40s, I would say, um, there were a couple things that went on that were pretty, you know, momentous in my life. My brother died by suicide. My husband had some heart issues, there were some health issues, um, and I, like most people, <laughs> like what we were told, if you look at any movie, any, <laughs> any, anything, it's like, oh, have a drink, make it easier, this is what you do, and, and so I did that, and, and then I realized that it was like, 
it was showing up in ways that I didn't like. Meaning, what that looked like for me was waking up in the middle of the night at about three o'clock in the morning, thinking, you know, I've got a headache. I am, you know, not feeling great. My mind was racing with, oh, I shouldn't have had that extra glass, or. Did I say something that I shouldn't have said? Or even just silly, like, what happened at the end of that show last night? And then the next day, it was just feeling groggy. It was just knowing that I wasn't running at 100%. I felt like I was driving with the emergency brake on. So still performing, still performing at work and advancing, and everything was fine. But I wasn't fine. I knew I, I could be better. And so I found a coach who helped me, and I thought that, I mean, I know it, it was so life-changing for me that I decided that I wanted to do it for other people. You're not teaching people not to drink. You're just teaching people to drink more responsibly. Yeah, no, I, I, the way that I say it is that I'm not, I'm not the boss. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I'm not an oracle. I don't know what somebody should be doing, and, and quite frankly, if somebody tells you that, then that's, I would... I would kind of pause there. But no. what I do is I help my clients really get to what's right for them. You know, I, I spoke with a client who I worked with last year, and she now is drinking. She has seven glasses a week. She's very happy with that level. She doesn't have the mind, the mental chatter that she used to have when she was drinking almost, not, not every night, but more nights than not, which I think is very typical for a lot of people. She certainly doesn't have the fights with her husband in front of her kids like she used to. It's all these little things that aren't, like, worthy of a tabloid, you know, <laughs> article or anything, but they mean something to our individual lives, and that's what's important. So I help my clients get to what's right for, their, for them. You know, some of my clients quit altogether. Some of them just keep it at a level that they, where they're happy. So why women? As opposed to say, uh, man, I know you had said that uh, I think 41% of women or, or alcohol consumption increased during the pandemic by 41% for women. I don't know what the stat is for men, but is there a, is it higher for women than it was for men, say, during that period? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't, I haven't seen the stats actually. I've been more keyed into on, on the stats for women. Um, I know across the board that it increased, for sure. I mean, if you look at any sort of high stress event, alcohol sales after that increase. So after 9-11 or Katrina or anything like that, they increased. Yeah, the liquor distributors just, just killed it right right from the get-go. They had record years and it's, it's yeah. really sad when you think about it, you know. And, I, you know, I think back, you know, my, over the course of my life, I was not a, I was not a drinker as a kid, um, but, you know, in my 20s, I, I drank a fair amount, and I look back on it, and I enjoyed it. I still, to this day, enjoy the experience when I choose to do it, and, and, and there are times where, I, where I'll overdo it, no question about it. What I haven't ever experienced is I've never, um, I've never craved it, and I and I wonder, you know, is 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 that what the issue is? For if you told me I could never have another drink for the rest of my life, I wouldn't even care. Yeah. But but at the same time, I don't want to be around like like I, I'm very so I don't know if, what this means. Maybe you can help me self-diagnose here. Yeah. 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 If if you if, if you're gonna have a holiday party and we're gonna get invited and I'm gonna have drinks I'm gonna enjoy it and then mm -hmm. in the back of my mind I will not do that for say the next two weeks mm -hmm. or three mm -hmm. weeks and mm -hmm. it's not even a it's not a difficult decision for me but what right. surprised me in my adult life and it first started in my in my late twenties when I got into management is how many of the people on my team had a drink every night after work you know a scotch or a whiskey mm -hmm. and these were young people and i thought what are you doing like what what is this this is a normal thing yeah they weren't getting drunk but they were drinking hard alcohol every single night yeah. and then as i've gotten older i realized that most of the people i know in my life have a glass of wine or a couple of beers every night yeah. and i've never done that in my life and yet yeah. i'll still go out and overindulge in the summer or yeah. or at a holiday party Great. but i stunned at how much of a routine it is for people. Is that more the norm 
than the person saying, you know, twice a month or? Well, I, I it, that's a hard question for me to answer because of course that's more the norm for the people that I talk to, <laughs> right? Like the daily, there's a the, the daily drink. The daily drinking, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And then I love how you've described how you approach alcohol because what you described right there is where my clients land, where my clients end up, where it's alcohol doesn't have any power over them necessarily. Right. They don't have that craving. They can they drink when they want to drink, but it's not a it's not taking up any mental space in their head because there's an opportunity cost to that thinking about it and then like the beating myself up, the beating ourselves up afterwards that, you know, if we can channel that energy into something that we actually want, that's where things get really exciting. So let me ask you this. This is interesting to me. Uh, again, me at 51 is so much different than me at 21. Yep. But if I put myself back, you know, 30 something years, and my buddies and I did stupid things and we overindulged and look, I can't even imagine watching what that must have looked like back then. But there, it was almost like a badge of honor. We loved it. You know, yeah. the, the worse you felt yeah. and the, the dumber you looked, it, yeah. was, it made the night even better. It was even yeah. more stuff to talk about. It was just phenomenal. Let's just keep talking about what we just did. Mm -hmm. And then we'll do it again next weekend. It just kept mm -hmm. on. It was always a weekend thing for me. Never a never weekday thing. But now I can't stomach that. I can't. I can't stand that piece of it. And and but but at one time it was like that's what you wanted. I wanted to feel sick, even though I. There's hate still people sick. like that. There's still people that are in their fifties that are still like bragging about. Oh, I had twelve. Whatever. I will say this, and I'm, I'm over. I'm over explaining here, but I never, as much as I have said, I love, I love this experience. I'm going to do this tonight. I have never had a drink in my life where I have felt better for it the next day. I have never oh, yeah. felt better, whether Absolutely. I've had one or five or ten, or what, I've never felt better for it. So, and then, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because how what you're describing of your experience is what my clients will feel like on the other side after we've worked together. And, you know, and, and one of the questions that I talk to my clients about is what is going to make you feel good afterwards? Because in the moment when you're having that craving, when you're, when it's five o'clock or six o'clock or whatever it is, and it is your brain, your primitive brain thinks it's time to drink, then there is some discomfort in sitting with that urge. So I, I use the example, I use my, my cat's not sitting here, but um, during COVID, Ernie, our cat, he, Is he a drinker, by the way? <laughs> he's not a drinker, but he's a big, he's a big snacker. Um, and, and we had typically given him a treat after dinner, right? And then during COVID, of course, everybody's here for all three meals, and Ernie is like sitting in his little treat spot, and he's like, okay, it's treat time. You guys are in the kitchen. Like, come on. <laughs> And, and we laugh about that because it's cute, right? Like, it's fine. Ernie's fine. He's not going to have three treats a day. Maybe he did a couple days, but whatever. But that's a, that's a habit that he got into. And that's what our brains are doing with alcohol, too. I mean, there's no morality there. There's no, like, moral question. There's nothing wrong with him. Of course he should ask, right? Like, why not? That's exactly what the primitive brain is doing. Why not? On that note. Because you're not dealing with somebody that has necessarily an alcohol addiction, that's different. Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about somebody that's a social drinker that might not be feeling great about themselves, what are, what are some of the things that you've discovered about your clients? For example, is it simply just a habit that got out of control and they just need a way to manage it? Or is it there, there's something else missing, like they don't feel comfortable socially without the drink? Or... Um, I don't feel, I don't like being around other people when they're drinking. So I drink too. Like what, what, what have you yeah. found is the reason why it's become such a, uh, I don't know, a desire or, or a, yeah. an automatic, is it simply just habit or is, are they trying to bring out an expressive side of themselves that doesn't yeah. always exist? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I, and it becomes a habit, but the reason that it becomes a habit is because we're not dealing with the emotions that are coming up at the time. So I don't want to feel uncomfortable. I don't want to feel left out when everybody else is drinking. I don't want to feel stressed because my job is crazy. 
I don't want to feel da, 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 whatever it is, lonely, grief, whatever. Um, it's not as obvious as that as you're going through it because we are socialized to know that having a drink will fix it. That's a coping mechanism. And so what I, what the work that I do is it's, is help them understand, kind of slow down a little bit. We take a magnifying glass to it and understand what's underneath there, what's driving it. And when we can address those issues, those opportunities, whatever it is, then all of a sudden, and we solve for that, then, then the drinking, like that need, quote unquote, that need to drink can take care of itself. There's some tactics, there's some strategies that we use that address that, that breaking that habit, unwinding, I call it unwinding that habit. No, that, that's on the tactic side, but really at a deeper level, we're talking about the things that are causing the stress, the things that are causing that thinking that's going into, that's creating that loneliness, whatever it is. In, in the end, are you coaching your clients to recognize that they have a choice in this? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So if you think about, you know, everybody says, and I think there's a common understanding that rehab only works if you want it or AA or any of those things. Okay. So interesting that that's a caveat there, that you have to want it. That means you have to put the work in. That means that recognize that you have some power there. Now, again, think about chemotherapy. You don't, have to like actively want for chemotherapy to work on your cancer. Now your mental state can help, but you don't have to do any actual work there. And that kind of tells me that there's more free will in this space than like the AA and rehab would have you believe. And when we tap into that and recognize that you always have a choice, we just haven't been, we don't have, a lot of times we don't have the tools to help us get there. We don't have the tools, we're not taught how to think critically and challenge our own thinking because we believe that if we think it, it's true. I don't do any life coaching, but the longer I coach people and the more I train people, the more I realize that if they, they don't take care of themselves, all of my coaching and training on how to have a difficult conversation or how to sell something, it yep. becomes that much harder. And mm -hmm. that's one of the things that I've really learned over the last couple of years is, you know, it could be, a, I, I could have a client who doesn't sleep well at night. Yeah. If they don't sleep well at night, they're not going to perform well during the day. And then I learned that, well, you don't sleep well because you, you have a couple of drinks at six or seven. Uh, and then you have coffee, you know, throughout the day. And so therefore yeah. you sleep well, which means your performance is down and, yeah. and then everything gets delayed. And so yeah. I, I wonder if, if at the end of the day, coaching, whether you're teaching somebody or helping somebody drink less uh, to, you know, to take better care of themselves, or I'm coaching somebody to be a more effective leader or salesperson or business professional, it all comes back to who are you outside of work and how well do you take care of yourself? And I, and I believe that for the most part with most people, it is a choice. But if, if the drinking, for example, is now the overriding habit, yeah. yeah. There's so many other things that need to now be addressed in order for that drinking to subside. You know, yep. the sleeping, the eating, yep. the hydrating, the exercise, the reading, the who are you hanging around? I mean, it's all these other things that can, I would think, feel overwhelming to somebody who doesn't understand the formula yet. Yeah, no, 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 I totally agree. And that's why, you know, we kind of start with the drinking part first. And then once... And really the first part, the first really module that I work on with my clients is this reestablishing self-trust. If, if you put yourself in the shoes of somebody who is drinking more than they intend to, not every day, all day, but you know, it's enough that it's bothersome to them. And it may not even be noticeable to anybody else, but it's bothersome to them. So they are, again, put yourself in that, their shoes and there's a lot of judgy thoughts about, I shouldn't have done that. I, I should be able to figure this out too. Cause remember I'm very successful in my career and my family and all this kind of stuff. My house looks beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, so why haven't I figured this out? And so they don't trust, it's, it's like they don't trust themselves to do it. They haven't figured it out. And so 
that first part is really reestablishing self-trust because at the end of the day, I mean, you, agree, you bring up such a great point. At the end of the day, it's like having that relationship with self is so critical. And a lot of times my clients have been, when people come to me, they, that has been, that is in, not in good shape necessarily. And I know that that's pretty much the norm because our relationship with alcohol is often a reflection of our relationship with ourselves. And when we, so if that's kind of off kilter, that indicates that our relationship with ourselves is off kilter as well. And reestablishing that, like, you know, if I were to go out and my marketing message is like self-love and da 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 a lot of people would be like, that's not for me. And so I, that's why I specifically target women who are drinking more than they intend and know that it could be better and want a little help to figure that out. I could teach myself how to play that guitar that's upstairs that is gathering some dust, but I haven't. And I know that if I really wanted to do that, then I could hire a coach, I could hire a teacher, I could sign up for a course. That will help me get there further faster. And my guitar is sitting in my closet too, by the way. It's been there for about, no lie, it's been there about three and a half years and I still haven't done that. But, but getting a coach to help with drinking, it, it's a much bigger decision mentally, I would think, yeah. for anyone, whether it's yep. a man or a woman. Yep. You know, it, 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 it's, it's got to be a harder, it, 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 because now you're, you're looking in the mirror and you're deciding to confront something that most of your friends are going to look at you and say, are you kidding me? Stop freaking feeling bad for yourself and grab a drink and sit down and let's have a glass of wine or let's have a beer. I mean, there are people out there that are trying to confront something that everyone around them is saying, that's ridiculous. That, oh, hey, I, good luck with your life, coach. We're absolutely. going down to the, you know, whatever. And it's just, I would think the social pressure there is got, and, and that, at that point, there's a lot of judgment or mockery that may come from the people around you. Because, mm -hmm. because now they've got to look in the mirror and say, shoot, am I missing something here? Because I think in a private moment, a lot of them would too. What's your take on that? Right, right, right. No, I totally agree. I totally agree. Yeah, we talk through a lot of that. I don't know that a lot of my clients, I guess it's kind of half and half on whether they are open with the people around them about what they're doing, because it can be a private thing. But to your point, you know, if, if you said that you were hiring a coach to lose weight, everyone would be like, oh, that's great. Good for you. Da, da, da. But there's so much, again, you know, it goes back to social norms. You're either a normal drinker or you're under a bridge, drinking out of a uh, a bottle in a paper bag. On the on the coaching though, I'm sorry to cut you off there, Carolyn. On the coaching, I'm I'm a business coach. You're a life coach. I get called a life coach all the time, and there are some people that think what I do is is bullshit. Do you ever run into that where people don't take what you do seriously? They they dismiss it, and therefore, hey, come over to this side because this is where it's really yeah at. yeah. Um, I'm, I, I know for sure that there are people that are out there, but you know, that's okay. That's none of my business. No, but that's what, the, when you think about the people that you have to help or mm -hmm. who might want your help, mm -hmm. it's helping them understand that what we're about to talk about is not what everyone else is talking about. Are you really, do you really want to go through this? And it comes back to that wanting it. Do you really yeah. want it? It's easy not to want it. It's easy just to keep doing what everyone else oh. is. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I, I, if you've seen the matrix, it's like plug back into the matrix and um, just keep going with what, whatever you're doing. But seeing that there is an opportunity, there's an opportunity for a brighter life. There is an opportunity for, you know, utilizing, you know, I'll go back to use, utilizing that brain energy, all that channeling that brain or that mental chatter into something that you really want. The clients that find me are the ones that say, I want that. I don't. I know that there is this underpinning of you should drink normally. You should just ignore that stuff. Just go have a drink. Absolutely. Um, but the people that I work with are the ones that are kind of raising their head and saying, you know what? I, I, I keep getting this little nudge inside of myself that things could be better. And I know that if I continue doing what I'm doing, it will, you know, things are going to stay the same, if not get worse. Sometimes it's important to kind of pull out of that 
uh, of that mentality, whether that be drinking, whether that be overeating, most, you know, two thirds of the US are, are obese or overweight. So like normal eating isn't so normal, right? Yeah, is, isn't that the real issue though, is people learn to, one, it becomes normalized, but I think a lot of people don't feel well all the time, but it's become so normal yeah. that yeah. they think it's normal. It, it, well, I should, I should feel this way. This is how people are. They are tired. I'm getting older. Or I'm supposed to, my stomach is supposed to bother me. I'm guess what happens when you get older. And, yep. and, yep. and, and the reality is, and, and I, I've spoken about this before, I have sleep apnea, for example. And for years, I thought being exhausted was normal. I'm like, well, I work out, I've got a job, I've got all these reasons to be exhausted, not knowing I had sleep apnea. I had no idea until I put on that silly mask 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. And my life changed like overnight. I'm like, this is yeah. what you're supposed to feel like in the yeah. morning. Yeah. And so, but it's the same thing when you change, I would think when you diet, dietary changes, or I would think when you remove alcohol, you realize that maybe this, these stomach issues I have are not, that doesn't have to be here all the time. Yeah. And my, I doesn't have to feel this way. And my energy yeah. doesn't have to. Well, what's a typical outcome that you see for your clients? Some of my clients have said, I want it out of my life entirely. And they've done that, and that's great. Some of them have said, you know, like the client I just mentioned, um, she has her seven glasses a week, which is kind of what the norm is. What that's what the standard amount is for women. Seven glasses a week is the, like the the average. Anything over that is considered problematic. Something that we need to kind of look at a little bit more. Okay. Um, those are not my standards. That's just like it's just a benchmark, yep. right? Uh, like every individual is going to be a little bit different, but here's the really important part that really kind of lights me up is that feeling like they have more control over their life and their drinking than they thought when they started. And that right there is a gold mine. It's just knowing that they have more control over their drinking, over their life is that's life changing. And, and control from the perspective of maybe saying no, but staying in the moment or choosing yeah, not to go yeah. two nights in a row. Yeah. Different things, yeah. Right? Like I used this example a while ago. I actually had my, uh, my BC reunion. So I flew up to Boston and somebody said, well, isn't that going to be weird for you to not be drinking or whatever? And I was like, I mean, I'm not going to Boston for the Bud Light, <laughs> right? I'm not going there for the Bud Light. I'm going there for the people. And, and that's, that's the experience that I was able to have. And I was much more connected to people. Well, obviously we're all older and all that kind of stuff than I was when we were actually in school and everybody's getting wasted. Yeah. I remember all the conversations. I, you know, like it was yeah. just, it was great. It was great. And at the end of the day, yes, there are some people that care what's in your glass, but what matters at the end of the day is what do you, like, what do you care about? Do you care what's in your glass or do you care about the people that you're with? And let's focus on that. Yeah, the, the, the people piece. There was a question you had given me, uh, do you still have fun when you drink less? And I think that that's kind of what you're t uh, tying yeah. into right now is you know, yeah. are you there for the people? Are you interested in them? Are you asking them questions? Yeah. You know, are there other things that you could, you could learn to enjoy about the experience than just the temporary feeling of the, of the booze? Right, right. And, and, like, like if, if you need a drink in order to deal with the environment wherever you are, then let's talk about that. Let's talk about why are you going? Like, if that's the only way you can deal with it, then maybe we should have another conversation. It's a good one to have right when the holidays are coming up, isn't it? Well, yeah, I think the timing of this is fantastic. So what, what's some advice you would give to somebody? You know, we've already, we just came back from a holiday party on uh, Friday night. And I had a great time, but I, it was managed. It was managed. But I still didn't feel great on Saturday morning, even though I, I was like, oh, I'm a little tired today. I still got up. We did our thing, but I was a little bit tired. What, what advice do you give to people as they, they're either in the throes of it or they're, they're about to be in the throes of it? Yeah, yeah. So in preparing for a social event, I think first and foremost, it's really important to um, go through, like think about how you want it to go. Imagine how how many drinks you want to have or not what you want those to be but take a minute just for yourself and just kind of center and think okay 
I'm going to so-and-so's house for the holiday party. No, here's the reality. For the most part, we know kind of how it's going to go. We know who's going to be there. We probably know what's going to be served. We know a lot of what people are going to be talking about. Because a lot of our lives is kind of rinse and repeat. So if you take a minute and just kind of think about that, kind of take yourself to that place and say, I don't want to have, um, I don't want to drink a bottle of wine like I did last year. I want to have one glass. I want to have no glasses. I want to have two glasses, whatever that is. Okay, so that's what I want to do. That's my intent. How am I going to, how am I going to make that happen for myself? What am I going to need to be feeling, thinking and feeling in order to achieve that? That's, That's one piece. piece. Like, kind of settle into that. Like, okay, I need to want, I want to feel connected to the people. Or I want to be curious about the people. I want to, like, ask them questions. I want to, I certainly don't want to feel like I'm left out. I don't want to feel anxious. I don't want to feel those feelings. So what are the feelings that I want to feel? And how can I generate that for myself? Now, from a tactic standpoint, I would say, practice your non-alcoholic drink order. Okay, it sounds really silly, but it's almost like muscle memory kicks in when you haven't practiced that. It's like, yeah, I'll have my red wine, or I'll have my vodka tonic, or I'll have, like, it just blurts out of your mouth, right? So that's why I think it's helpful to practice what, you know, if you're going to intersperse that, uh, your regular drinks with other drinks, practice it. Like, literally run it through your head so that that muscle memory doesn't kick in, or, or, or the muscle memory kicks in for the other one. I think it's also important to recognize that most people are feeling like there's something called a spotlight, spotlight effect. And, and if you picture a stage and there's a spotlight on you and everything else is dark, um, you can't see what other people are doing. You have a spotlight on yourself and you can't see what the other people are doing. Everybody else is kind of walking around with that same spotlight effect going on. So yeah, they may, you may get a little ribbing on why aren't you drinking or something like that, maybe a comment or two, but for the most part, everybody's in their own little cocoon and they're worried about what other people th are thinking and what are they doing and am I saying it right, am I dressed okay, am I whatever, did I bring the right gift? Um, so if you is can that, is, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I've heard people say this before. Is that a normal thought? My wife says this to me all the time. Like, do you really care what anyone else thinks you said or how you said? But that seems to be a normal thing. Is that? Yeah. Is that, yeah. Like yeah. you're thinking about, well, do I look? Am I wearing the right shirt? I, I mean, like half the time I got a stain on my shirt. I'm like, yeah, it's a stain. I got it on right, the way. Right. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But but people care about that stuff. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So just recognizing that 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 everybody else is kind of in the same boat. That alleviates a lot of tension. Yeah. I mean, and that helps kind of bring some connection points to others, too. It's like, we are all in the same boat. Everybody's kind of got this, well, other than you. Uh, no, I'm just teasing. But, um, you know. Well, as you get older, you think, you think as people get older, you, you move on from, I'm worried about if I said that right to you, or mm -hmm. did I use the right word, or am I, is my shirt nice enough to be in this crowd? Like, I would just think as time goes on, you. I don't know. Like, like, what what difference does any of that make? I, I did have a, a question on, um, and I, don't, I hope I'll, I, I hope I'm not cutting off your thought. Am I cutting off no, your you're thought? Good. You're good. J just in terms of just when you go out there, if you decide, yeah, you know, I'm gonna have one drink or no drinks or two drinks. What are the other things you could default to? And you would mention just asking questions, being curious about other people, which is always yeah. It, it's a it's a it's a diamond. You know, it's yeah. a gold mine if if you have the ability to do that or the desire to do that. But other yeah. things like music, is there music there? Uh, it, 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 are there games to play? You know, if the, yeah. Is there a dartboard or a pool table or, a, or the people playing Pictionary or something? Yeah. There's all yeah. sorts of other things that can create awesome distractions that, that you, where the night can be fun and it's you know, funny and yeah. you're not focused on the, the glass. It doesn't yeah. even matter, no one's noticing it. But I always think about that. If I'm invited somewhere, if I invite somebody here, are there other things for people to do? Or is mm -hmm. it just sitting around this damn table? Or this and damn bar? I want to know that this, you know, there's a dartboard, this cornhole, this music, go play, yeah. you know, there's yeah. something. Food, there's food. Food, absolutely. You know, so, so are you that's concentrating on that stuff? Yeah, no, no, that's, that's such a great point. Because I, a lot of people have this, this um, belief that drinking is fun. But if we took a camera and, and looked at, at the activities, 
It's typically people sitting around a table or sitting on the couches and there are maybe standing up even, but there's not, if you just had a camera and didn't have the sound on or anything, it doesn't look like that much fun. No, it's right? terrible. It's terrible to watch. <laughs> to your point, it, it's really helpful to yeah find some other activity. Um, and if it's not there, maybe you can instigate it. Maybe you can bring that up. So that's, that's a really fun thing to do for sure. What was your other question? Just like just defaults, like like when when you go there, rather than focus on how you look and what you're gonna say and how many drinks, which is important, I guess, but also, are there distractions there? Are you going to? Are you inviting somebody to a place that has these other alternatives, mm -hmm. or are you going to a place where there's other alternatives? There are distractions. There's something going on in the background. There's a game to play. There's a, you know, a song on the radio. Like something. That, that's going to take you away from focusing on the drink itself. Yeah. Um, so that was really all I was saying is, is are there strategic ways to make sure that you're putting yourself in a position where it's not all about the drink? Right, 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 right. And also notice too, just in that conversation, the focus is shifted from internal, like with that, that spotlight on, like, am I doing it right to external? Like, what else can I be doing? Who can I be talking to? And that really is, that is the point. That is why we get together with other people. Yeah. Well, <laughs> as a coach, and, and I've just gotten this way over the years, is I, I'm concerned about how many people, and I kind of I made that comment to you earlier in jest, because there are so many people out there that are only concerned about how they look and how they feel. Mm -hmm. And it's the epitome and this is gonna this is gonna come across as judgmental, but it, it's true in a lot of ways that I'm selfish. Is I need to know that I look good and sound good and to you. Mm. And if, if my concern is all about how I look and how I feel, and do you think I'm smart and do you think I'm funny, and then how do I pay attention to you? Mm. Yeah, I would actually, if I could um, tweak that a little bit, I would say it's insecurity versus selfish. Okay. And that's, it's coming from a very different energy than like me, 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 me. It's coming from, um, and again, it's, it's kind of, everybody's going to be a little bit different, but, um, it's not from a desire to not want to connect. It's not having those skills to be able to do that. Does that go back to choice though? When you're talking to a client, you say, you do realize what you're depriving the other people of, which is you. No worrying or your insecurity about this or that is taking the, it, it, is, it, you're losing an opportunity to yeah. connect with them and give yeah, them yeah. of, give, give them something, something of you. you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and so, so if, if, if it, there's no question it's insecurity, but if, if the insecurity lasts for years and years and years, ultimately it's, I focused so much on me that you never got to know me because I was too worried about what you thought of me. Yeah. And, and even giving of, self to the other person yeah. you know it, it's really helpful um, what haven't i asked you what haven't i asked you i've been i've been cutting you off for the last 45 minutes I, it's always so fun to talk to people because i think this is a topic that most people can, can relate to i mean as we said our society normalizes drinking and it, it's like it is part of our everyday life it's like we're like fish in water so we, we see it everywhere right. um, one thing I, I just wanted to comment on was I noticed that um, when I really cut back on my drinking in a work situation, so I would go to cocktail parties and have my club soda and lime or whatever, and I noticed what was so interesting is after I got over this idea that people really cared what was in my glass, which, you know, in the beginning some people did, but that was fine. What I noticed, though, is it's actually a superpower because, or it certainly was for me, is because as people drink more, they get a little sloppy, they get like less sharp. Yeah. And here I am, I'm like, oh, yeah, I can connect the dots pretty quickly. And everybody's like, oh, she's really smart. I'm like, yeah, I am. <laughs> I have an advantage right here. So, which I think is really interesting, particularly for your audience. It's like, it, I'm, I'm a coach, so I'm helping my clients kind of see a different perspective. Yeah. So when we see it from the perspective of this is an advantage yeah. to drink less, yeah. everybody's like, wait a minute, you're crazy. But then, okay, there's some logic there. I get that. I can see how that could work. Yeah. So just wanted to throw that in no, as we're talking it, about like it, business situations. 
No, it's true. It's true. You know, early, early days in business, uh, uh, 25, 26, 27, going to the holiday party was, we're going to rip it up. And, mm -hmm. and, and I didn't care what anyone thought. I didn't care how loud I was or how sweaty I was on the dance floor. I didn't care. It was just so... And I, if somebody played that video, those videos to me today, I think I just want to crawl under a rock and move to a yeah. different planet. And Thank and, God we don't have social media, right? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. But, you know, I agree with you. You know, when you're when you when you more measured about it, you know, when you finally recognize, you know, that might not be. And it's not how you look. It's just I don't feel right. And then you realize if somebody ever shows you a picture, oh, my goodness, I can't believe that was me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you might look a little smarter if you if you if you just you know hedge back a little bit. All right, I, uh, is there any? What about people who want to get to who want to reach you, Caroline? Where should they where should they call or check you yeah. out? Um, so I've got a website which is carolineholkecoaching.com, which is C A R O L I N E H O L K E coaching.com. Um, I will also mention that I've got a free stop over drinking course that's on my website and I will give you a link if you want to include that. Yes. Um, I will make it, I, I just want to put a plug in here for this because it's not a stop drinking class. It's a stop over drinking. Right. And when I first heard this language, I was like, ding, ding, ding. That's exactly what I want. I don't want to quit drinking entirely. I just want that. I want to get rid of that overing part. That's a feeling. And so I, this is just a bare bones kind of fundamentals and it's an email course. So you don't have to show up at a certain time or anything like that. And it's in your email box. So, um, I, a lot of people have, I've gotten some great feedback on, on that course and now that's, that's been helpful for them. So, yeah, I, I really enjoyed this conversation because it, it's part of all of our lives. Yeah. I don't know anybody in my life that isn't thinking about this to some extent and some have some have made the adjustments and some haven't you know i i'd, lo I'd love i'd love for alcohol just to be something that people can enjoy at times and say no to more times than not we'll see we got a, we got, we got a lot of marketing yeah. against us there a lot of marketing against us yeah actually one one last thing too just because i think it's fascinating is that the alcohol industry actually spend has a bigger ad spend than any other category in the u.s now, there are times when cars, their sales, no, I'm sorry, their media spend is higher than alcohol, but it just, there are just certain times throughout the year where that happens. But for the most part, alcohol is spending a ton of money on, on advertising. And the reality is that works. I mean, even for the smartest people, I'm sorry, we, we see those messages over and over and over again. And our brain is like open source code. Like some of that message seeps in. And we internalize that and start acting as if that's normal. Now you're going to get me commenting again, because, okay. and, and, I'll, and I'll stop after this, but that's exactly it. You know, that whole normalization, when you see something enough, even if it's something terrible, yeah, yeah. If, you know, you could, you could watch crime shows all the time and all of a sudden it normalizes crime or hate speech. If you yeah. listen to it all the time, it doesn't mean you'll necessarily believe it, but it, it's normalized in you. Yeah. Same with all this stuff. And that's where I get crazy inside around what it is that we're selling to people and marketing to people. People, for the most part, are so naive. They have no idea how easily manipulate. We were all, we're all easily manipulated if we're not aware. And it, it's just, it's just a shame because you'll have work for the rest of your life, by the way, there's, n there'll never be a time where you're not, you're not having somebody say, Hey, Caroline, I need some, I need some help because all the marketing is yep. just sucking these problems back into the system. So yep. anyway, I'll, I'll stop talking. Okay. I really like this conversation. It was fun. And I, and I hope you have a great holiday season. Thank you so much. Thank for being you. here. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. You're welcome. You've been listening to cut through the noise with Dave Toronto. Please subscribe, and for more information, check us out on Instagram at CTTN Podcast. <laughs>